Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship found in your bulletins. If you are tired, come and worship. If you are joy-filled, come and worship. Our God desires our worship, whether we have much or little to give. All who are gathered here, come and worship. please uh, join our hearts in the attitude of prayer. Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the many blessings you've given us. We pause in our daily lives, Father, in remembrance of the men and women in the military for over the past years has provided us with the freedom that we enjoy today. We need to remember them in prayer and in reverence. As we light our peace lamp once again, we pray for guidance for our leaders and the leaders around the world so that they may find a solution for this war on terror. We pray for the safety of our peacekeepers that are stationed in many foreign countries. Father, we pray that you would hold our troops in their loving hands, protect them as they protect us. We pray that you would bless them and their families for the selfless acts and sacrifices that they perform in this time of need. We especially pray, Father, for our fellow church members, Peter and Dustin, who have been deployed in harm's way. We pray for the men and women for the 10th Mountain Division that are deployed in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and Kuwait. We pray that you would Extend your love and protection to each of them till they can return to their loved ones. We humbly ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us welcome each other in the name of Christ.
Please remain standing for the opening prayer. We gather today in the name of the one. Who is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last. We gather today in the name of the one. Who gave us all the opportunity for repentance that leads to life. We gather today in the name of the one. Whose command creates all things. We gather today in the name of the one. Whose glory is our we gather today in the name of the one. We gather today in the name of the one. Make us new, Lord. Make, Make us, us new. new. Amen. Amen. Y'all may be seated and kids from any age, come on up and join me for a few minutes. Nope, let's not this way, this way, this way. Well, that's it. Come on. I'm next to you. You're next to me this morning. Great. Come on, sit down. I'm wearing a dress. You are, so am I. How about that? Who's wearing a dress this morning? You're wearing a dress. Yeah, you're wearing a dress. Good morning, you two. You want to come in the circle? No? Okay, that's fine. How many of you have seen geese fly? Not me. I yesterday. You did? Yes. I mean, no, actually, two days ago. Two days ago. You've seen geese? What shape do geese fly in? Yes. A V. It, it is. It's kind of like a triangle and stuff. Do you know that most of the time we see geese flying, especially in that V, is two times a year? Once in the fall and once in the spring. Do you know why they're so prevalent in the spring and the fall? What do you think? What do you think? And in the spring? That's exactly right. For folks who didn't hear that, he had exactly the right answer. In the fall, they migrate. How about that word? It's like butterflies. And then they migrate back. <laughs> How do they know when to migrate? Olivia. No, I said how. The V shape tells them. Probably not, but good guess. How do they know when to migrate? Yes. Okay, so there's something that tells them somehow, we don't know how, in the fall, they better get going because winter's coming. So they're down in all these nice warm places. How do they know to come back north? Callie. Mm, that could be. What do you think? Orange. Uh, that could be. Little Olivia? Probably that place will get warmer, though, sometimes. Thing is, we don't know. That's the real answer. We don't know what goes on in a, a goose's brain that tells them it's time to go south or it's time to go north. Have you ever had an experience where you sensed something that you needed to go see a friend, or you needed to give your mom or dad an extra hug for something. Nobody told you that you had to do it. You just kind of felt like something was telling you. Olivia. Oh, you're trying to suck up to mom and dad if you've done something wrong. Right. Right. So something tells us in we sense something that we should do something. Well, the Apostle Paul, we adults are going to hear the story that the Apostle Paul had that sense as well, that something told him that he needed to go to a place called Macedonia, which is in modern-day Greece, to spread the word of Jesus. Now, Nobody told him outright, Paul, you need to go to Macedonia. But he sensed it in a vision 
the best thing he did was is he, he recognized that that came from God. And I think sometimes those nudges that we get when we sense that a friend is sad and something's telling us maybe we ought to go see a friend or maybe it's time to go see mom and dad because we've done something wrong and we should apologize or we are sensing that we need to call somebody. Those are nudges that come from God and that's God's spirit that tells us without saying it verbally that we need to do something. It's kind of like geese. I think it's also kind of God's spirit that tells them it's time to go south or come back north. Hold on. So the trick is to recognize the fact that God is speaking to us even without words, but that those nudges that we get, especially good nudges, are the things that we need to do. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, does that make sense out there? That's good. Does that make sense in the choir loft? Yeah. All right, good. So let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for today, and we thank you for those nudges that you give us. God, we pray that you would help us recognize those nudges and to act on them, that when your spirit is asking us to move, that we move in your direction. We give you thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Goodbye, guys. Goodbye. Goodbye. I have Enjoy your day. Well, now that half the congregation is gone. <laughs> but friends, we come to a time in our service where we do have opportunity to share witnesses to the presence of God in our lives, God's sightings, joys, and concerns. Anyone? Choir? Paul Simmons. Yes, Pastor Penny, how are you? I'm just swell, and yourself? Great. Uh, I don't see him here today, Nick, who is our custodian, who has been with us now 18 months. Nick is moving on to another job, and a much better job, at least in his mind. We thought we were great people anyway. But Nick is taking a full-time position, and we do have a small cake back here telling Nick thank you, but if you happen to see him, please make sure he knows how much Asbury truly did appreciate what this man did. Uh, Nick did a lot, and he grew a lot under our helpful eyes and watching. But again, a good blessing for Nick, and we're working on replacing him as fast as we can. That's why SPRC is meeting Wednesday. Darlene. Um, I'd like to have prayers for my mom. We spent yesterday in the ER, whether um, they admitted her last night. Um, they're doing a lot of tests and everything. We're not quite sure. They think she may have had a heart attack, but we, they're doing more tests to find out for sure. And uh, she complained of a pain in, in, under her rib cage and stuff. So we, Dr. Goslin thinks that she may have broken a rib, coughing, something like that. But we're, I need prayers for her. We do. So prayers for Doris. Yes. Good Lisa. morning. Good morning, Lisa. Um, I, was, I would just like to, for us to all remember the reason that some of us have an extra day off this weekend or maybe even two days off. And, you know, while we enjoy going to our barbecues and celebrating with each other, we, we need to remember the real reason for this holiday and to just give thanks and praise to the gentlemen and women who have served and are either active duty or, or retired and we have some wonderful people right in this congregation that should be recognized for their service so I'm just a shout out to them and thank you so much for your service thank you so much Lisa <clears throat> friends let us let us never forget others joys concerns Bob mentioned already but for those who are uh, in the broadcast a concern and a joy I'll do the joy second it's always nice to end on a happy note um, I'm the cameraman and I won't be here next week so there will not be uh, for those of you on the broadcast uh, please be advised uh, next week will not be recorded we do not have a spare camera person at this point 
And the reason is, is a family reunion is uh, in the plans for next weekend. So that's a joy. Thank you. Thank you. Other joys, concerns, prayer requests? Patty? Yes, Lynn. Prayers of Toby as he undergoes knee surgery this week. Yes. Did you know that Toby has four knees? <laughs> this, is, this is knee number four, right? So we pray God's blessing upon you as you go to Utica to have this surgery. And we pray, too, that uh, it will go well and that you will be back among us very quickly. Other joys, concerns. You will notice in the bulletin that um, I am going um, to Rochester on um, this weekend. Um, I, I'll get to see some of my family, but that's not the point. Um, Saturday um, will be the f um, closing service for the Palmyra United Methodist Church. The church that I served for eight years, folks who I love and ministered to in many ways, not only in the church, but in the community. We are going to celebrate, but it is going to be a tough time. I have, been, I have talked to several folks, and, and they have really struggled making this decision. It was not taken lightly, um, but they knew that this part of the journey for Palmyra was done. The good news is that there are lots of other churches in the area who have already extended hospitality to the folks in Palmyra to join them. Um, so they have ample places that they can go to worship. But I would ask that, especially on Saturday, if you think of it, to pray for the folks in Palmyra as um, we say goodbye to well over 150 years of ministry, Methodism came to the Palmyra area in 1797. Um, the church was established then and moved around several times. And then in 1866, they secured the lot on the four corners in Palmyra, which is the corners of 21 and 31, <coughs> um, and built that congregation or built that building. Um, little known fact, that they are in the Guinness Book of World Records at four corners, because there are four Gothic churches on, the, on those corners. So please keep them in your prayers. Others? Joys? Concerns? Anyone? Please join your hearts with mine in prayer. Gracious God, on this Memorial Day weekend, we give you thanks and praise, because God, you have worked in the hearts and minds of all who have served faithfully. We thank you for the service that our men and women have given and continue to give, and their families as well. We ask God that you would help us to remember to remember sacrifices that have been made, lives that have been lost, families that have been distanced because of service. So we pray your blessing upon all, and we ask that we would pause at some point during this time to remember. And God, we give you thanks for the day that you have gifted us with, this Sabbath day, this day that is meant to be different than the other six, a day that is set apart for you, God, to worship you, to witness to our faith, to hear your word proclaimed in many ways, not just to keep it to ourselves or to make us feel good or maybe even to make us think, which is things that need to be done. But as we leave this place, God, you charge us to go to friends and neighbors, to be able to share in our own unique ways your good news, the good news of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you give us this day for rest and recuperation because Days are hectic. Work is demanding. School is difficult. 
So we thank you for this day set apart and pray your blessing upon us. We have lifted joys and concerns to you, God, shared amongst brothers and sisters and silent within our hearts and thankful that you hear each and every one. In our scripture passage this morning, we will hear about the Apostle Paul and Silas who had doors slammed in their faces figuratively until you opened a way for them to go into uncharted territory. Help us learn from those experiences that although doors sometimes are slammed shut, there's other doors just waiting to be opened if we have the patience and the perseverance. Lord God, for this day and time, we give you thanks. For your Holy Spirit that moves among us, we give you thanks. We give you thanks and praise for your Son, our risen Savior, Jesus the Christ. And in Jesus' words, we pray to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 9 through 15. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night, a man of Macedonia, who was standing, beseeching him, and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Setting, th setting sail, therefore, from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and following, uh, the, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we, su we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of the Theatera, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart and to give heed to what was said by Paul. And when she was baptized with her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please join us in our next hymn. It is from the Faith We Sing book, number 2253, Water, River, Spirit, Grace, 2253. Let us pray. Water, river, spirit, grace, sweep over me. Clear out all that stops me from hearing your word. And water, river, spirit, grace, sweep over me. Refill me to listen, to listen to your word. And in your perfect way and perfect time to act upon those words. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As an aside this morning, I want to give a shout out to Nate. He had some really tough words in that scripture this morning. <laughs> I saw him, he was a little puzzled, and what I said to him, I would say to anybody, just say it like you know it. Doesn't really matter. The two-bedroom house was small enough to manage more than enough for one person. Nestled on the shores of Black Lake, the house commanded breathtaking views of the lake in all seasons. Only 10 miles from Ogdensburg, it was close to shopping, doctors, and Canada. My friend Beth lived next door. 
She bought her house from the same folks who now put this bungalow up for sale. Since the properties were very close together, the owners promised Beth that when they sold the house, they would give her first rights. Beth and I talked a lot about it. What would it be like to live next to each other? How could we maintain our privacies and our friendships? Satisfied with our answers, we approached the owners. Through me, Beth wanted to take up on their offer. So I offered them their asking price. Imagine my surprise when they told me that they had received a counter offer. How could that be? They promised Beth first refusal on the property. But undeterred, I countered the offer. I really should have looked at my bank account first, but I didn't. <laughs> You know how it is when you go to buy a house and stuff, they tell you all these things that you're supposed to do, right? You know, you put a marble on the floor to see if the floors go this way or that. You look at the windows to see if there's any kind of water damage or any of that. But you also know that your emotions play into the whole thing. So I countered the offer. Well, a few days later, I found out they countered the offer. So I countered again. Should have looked at my bank account, but I didn't. Well, they countered again as well. Finally, I said, enough is enough. I let the property go. And I was very, very disappointed. Can you imagine property on Black Lake? I mean, it was absolutely, it is an absolutely beautiful piece of property. I felt as though God had literally slammed that door in my face. And I had a very hard time accepting why this was happening. A few months later, I received a call from my district superintendent. I was moving to Palmyra and Manchester. Three hours and 175 miles one way away from Black Lake. As the years went by, I fell in love with the Rochester area. I found a townhome that was easy to maintain and something I could afford. And eventually all my family migrated to the Rochester area. Unlike the Black Lake property, my new property, I didn't have to worry about mowing or shoveling as long as I pay those darn HOA fees. I didn't have to crawl under the house to access the pipes in case there was a water main break. Essential services are less expensive in Rochester than the North Country. One could say God slammed that door in my face in 2009 because there was something better waiting down the road. I needed to trust that God had my best interest at heart, no matter what it looked like in the present or how I felt. At the end of Acts 15, the Apostle Paul and Barnabas decided to take a road trip to visit the people in every city where they preached the Lord's word, wanting to see how everyone was doing. This would eventually morph into what we know today as Paul's second missionary journey. But before the trip began, Paul and Barnabas had a disagreement concerning who would accompany them, and eventually they parted company. Paul, along now with Silas, his new traveling companion, went on the road and continued to encourage those congregants in those established churches. Once that loop ended, Paul and Silas decided to travel throughout Asia to share the good news of Jesus Christ with other people. They tried to stay in the province of Asia. However, the Holy Spirit thwarted their efforts. 
They tried to go to Phegria and Galatia, where we know Paul had planted a church. So it made sense that he wanted to go to Galatia. However, Scripture tells us that the Spirit thwarted any attempt at preaching in that area as well. So traveling through Phrygia and Galatia, Paul and Silas headed north from the province of Mysia to the province of Bithia. Once again, the Spirit blocked them from entering. My guess is that at this time, they were not happy campers. They felt as though another door slammed in their faces while asking each other, why can't we continue to preach the good news of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles in Asia? Well, blocked from entering Bithia, they traveled to the seaport of Troas. And that night, Paul received the answer to his questions through a vision. A man from Macedonia pleaded with him to come to Macedonia to help him. Paul interpreted that vision to mean he and Silas were to go to Macedonia to preach the good news to a completely new region. They were going to Europe. And that's exactly what they did. They eventually found their way to Philippi, a Roman colony in the district of Macedonia. You see, God closed the Asian route so that they could expand God's message in new and unchartered waters. Stymied up to this point from preaching, I'm sure they were more than ready to find fellow Jews so that they could share God's good news. However, when they arrived in Philippi before the sa- they arrived in Philippi before the Sabbath, so they couldn't go to any synagogues. So they chose to explore the area. And they found out that Philippi didn't have a synagogue as one needed at least 10 men to establish a synagogue. If there was no synagogue, what were they to do? You see, they always preached in established synagogues. That's how they shared Christ. Another way to say it was, We've always done it that way. However, the established pattern, the path always taken, could not happen at this time. Can you envision how frustrated these two men might have been? God's Spirit stopped their preaching several times in Asia. Now brought to Europe by God's Spirit, that same Spirit stopped them again. Another door slammed. Why and what were they to do? Have there been times in your life when God's Spirit stopped you from doing that at the time, made perfect sense. Unseen forces blocked a path you were certain you were to follow. Or maybe patterns long established that worked in the past no longer brought the desired results. Feelings of frustration build up. What do you do? Well, Paul and Silas did what we all should do when all of our good intentions seem thwarted. Pray. Pray for guidance. Pray for the Holy Spirit to lead step by step, one step at a time. Pray to be open to whatever the Spirit has for them or us. In all likelihood, it will look very different from our preconceived notions. Instead of trying to make the old ways work in a new situation, allow the spirit to lead into a new situation 
and be able to lead with open hearts. Well, when Sabbath came, Paul and Silas tried something new. They went to the outskirts of town where they thought men might gather for prayer. Well, people did gather at the river for prayer that day, but there weren't any men there. They were women. Scripture tells us one in particular stood out, an unattached woman named Lydia. Scripture tells us Lydia was a dealer of purple cloth from the textile city of Thyatira. Now, why is that particular tidbit important? Why would the writer of Acts tell us that Lydia was a seller of purple cloth from this particular city? Well, you see, the color purple was significant because purple clothing was the mark of wealth and loyalty in the Roman world. To be dressed in purple was to boast of influence and power. So one can conclude that Lydia, because she dealt with those who wanted purple cloth, she was a wealthy businesswoman, an atypical, unattached woman in first century society. In a male-dominated society, Lydia stood apart. Lydia was a savvy, wealthy businesswoman. She was able to maneuver in a man's world and do very well for herself. That's pretty impressive on its own, especially given the first century's cultural attitudes toward women. However, the better news was Lydia, a Gentile, was already a worshiper of God. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, called this working of the Spirit before her encounter with Paul and Silas, provenient grace. That type of grace that paves the way for us to be receptive to the saving work of Christ. So Lydia, prompted by the Spirit, listened to Paul and Silas, listened to them as they preached the good news of Jesus Christ. Scripture tells us, as she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart and she accepted that which Paul said. She and her household were saved. And baptized. Once baptized, she immediately stepped out in faith to offer hospitality to Paul and Silas. Scripture tells us, she said, if you agree that I am a true believer in the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she urged us until we agreed. In first century society, her offer was highly unusual. Unrelated men and single women didn't do that. Yet the spirit has a way of breaking down all kinds of barriers if we are willing to listen to the spirit's prompting and step into new and sometimes unfamiliar and or uncomfortable territories. All of this points to a woman motivated by faith over fear. It would have been the norm for Lydia to enter into a conversation with Paul and Silas with much discretion and restraint. As one of my commentators said, in time, Lydia's house became a center of Christian worship and outreach in Philippi, and Paul developed a close and loving bond with the church members there. Later, when he wrote his letter to the Philippians, he expressed his gratitude in this way. He said, you Philippians indeed know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, 
No church shared with me in the manner of giving and receiving except you alone. No church shared with him and supported him except the Philippians. They were the generous ones. They were the hospitable ones. They were the faithful ones. And it all started with Lydia, a woman who chose faith over fear. Paul and Silas expected a synagogue and men. They found a river's edge and women. Instead of turning their backs and going to another town, Paul and Silas stayed and ministered to Lydia and the others, which in time became the Church of Philippi. All because Paul and Silas listened to the promptings of the Holy Spirit and didn't become discouraged at doors being slammed. You never know what surprises God has for you when you set your personal agendas aside, take the time to listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, and then act upon them. Oftentimes, doors shut for reasons unbeknownst to us. Instead of reacting or getting frustrated, perhaps that's a signal to listen for God's promptings. God may close one door because another one is ready to open, one with greater opportunities than you might dream or imagine. So friends, are you listening? Yes. Amen. Let us pray. Holy One, sometimes it is so hard to discern your Spirit's promptings. As we chew on this this week, help us to tune in to your Spirit. Help us to be able to discern your Spirit's promptings. Help us not to get hurt or frustrated when doors continue to slam shut in front of us. Help us to remember that when those doors slam shut, you already have another door waiting to be open. We give you thanks in the name of Christ. Amen. Friends, it's we come to a time in our service where we do have opportunity to give ourselves and our tithes and gifts and offerings in our morning worship.
pray together. We do not only offer our gifts to you, but our community to all who are lonely, our hearts to all who are grieving, our hope to all who have lost their way, our lives to all who are tossed aside by the world. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final hymn is number 555. reminder after church today there is not one but two cakes oh yeah one is to help us remember on Memorial Day those who gave that sacrifice and we are thankful the other one is for Nick who is here today in the back in red and white please have a moment after the service is ended to thank Nick for his faithful service and to pray God's blessing on him as he goes into this new endeavor with his new job. Friends, I invite us to join together in our sending forth. Our God, who is gracious, sends us out to be a blessing. Jesus, who is our brother, sends us to be with others. The Holy Spirit, who is our advocate, sends us into a broken world. We will work for justice for all oppressed. We will teach songs of hope to all who despair. Amen.
This has been a broadcast of the 1015 service Sunday morning from Asbury United Methodist Church located on Franklin Street in Watertown, Asbury United Methodist Church.